Ephesians 1.1. And I want to talk to you for a few minutes this morning about do you know who you are? Romans chapter 1 and beginning in verse 1. Just want to remind you about uh, Yeshua in the Passover this coming Friday evening. Uh, our friends from Messiah's house are going to be here. We're going to have a Passover Seder dinner now. Listen, we're just having like a little sample of what they eat at the Passover. So do not come hungry or you will leave hungry. Um, make sure you come full and then you'll just get a little sample uh, of, uh, of what they eat in the Passover supper. And it's an opportunity to see Jesus at, at every point. In the, this is the meal that Jesus shared with his disciples in the upper room. And if you've never had a chance to sit through a presentation like that, I know you'll be blessed by it. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Do you know who you are? Romans 1.1, 1, 1, the Bible says, Paul, a servant. Now that word servant means a love slave. Paul, a love slave of Christ Jesus. I want you to notice the word order. Christ is the word Messiah. Paul, a love slave of Messiah, Jesus. Called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, we received grace and apostleship to call. I want you to just say that word call with me. Call. In fact, if you're underlining, if you're reading from a, a paper Bible and you underline in your Bible, I want you to underline that word call. We've received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his namesake. And you, I want you to say you with me. You, if you're underlining, underline you, and you also are among those Gentiles who are called. Would you say called with me? Called. Underline it. If you're underlining, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his saints. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice three times call, called, and called. We're going to talk about that this morning. Would you pray with me and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Father, thank you for your presence with us. I pray, Father, that we would encounter you this morning through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you just say amen, amen. and amen. Today we're going to begin studying what has been called the greatest letter ever written. Paul's letter to the Christians in the city of Rome. Romans is not only the longest letter that Paul wrote, it's also the most significant of his letters. Romans contains the most systematic presentation of the gospel in the entire New Testament. And Romans has had a profound impact on key people throughout church history. St. Augustine, who was the most prominent of the early church fathers, came to faith in Christ while he was reading Romans chapter 13. Martin Luther, the father of Protestant Christianity, came to faith in Christ through one line from the book of Romans, the just shall live by faith. William Tyndale, who was strangled and burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English, came to faith through reading the book of Romans. If you happen to be carrying a King James Bible today or a new King James Bible, about 75 to 80 percent of the Bible on your lap was translated by William Tyndale. John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, the second best-selling book of all time after the Bible, which he wrote while he was in prison for his faith, came to faith through reading Romans. John Wesley, the father of Methodism and the grandfather of Pentecostalism, came to faith through Romans. Karl Barth, the most influential Protestant theologian of the 20th century, came to faith through reading Romans. When Paul sat down in the city of Corinth and wrote to the Christian believers in Rome, it's clear that he didn't write an ordinary letter. He wrote a letter from heaven, a letter inspired by the Holy Spirit, to speak to all believers in Jesus of all times. Today we want to invite you to join us on a journey 
as we read this letter together, listening to what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us from the book of Romans. I don't know whether you've noticed, but the fabric of our society is coming completely unraveled. People are coming unglued out there. Have you noticed it? A friend of mine who travels for business told me a story about a flight that was canceled one day. There was a very long queue of frustrated passengers at the gate trying to get information about another flight. And at the front of the line was a businessman who was screaming at the gate agent. He was shouting, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? Well, apparently the gate agent had all she could stand. She couldn't stand no more. And so she picked up the intercom and she said, attention, ladies and gentlemen, does anyone know who this man is? He seems to have forgotten. (laughs) You know, I can't think of a picture that better summarizes Romans chapter 1 and the state of our society today. Does anyone know who this man is, he seems to have forgotten. He seems to have forgotten that he was made in the image of God. He seems to have forgotten that he was designed by his creator to be crowned with honor and glory instead of the shameful behavior that we see today. He seems to have forgotten that he was destined to exercise dominion over all the works of God's hands and to live with everything, every frustration, every problem, every enemy under his feet. He has forgotten who God is. And in the process, he has forgotten who he is. There's one thing that the devil never, ever wants you to discover, and that is who you really are. He doesn't want you to discover who God created you to be. He doesn't want you to discover what God has destined for you and for all of mankind. What God has designed for mankind is what the angels could never have. It's what Satan tried to take by sedition but could not obtain. What God has destined for mankind is to sit with God on God's own throne and to share a portion of God's glory that he has willed to bestow to us. Mm. The devil never wants you to find out who you really are. And if you ever do find out, He'll do everything he can to make you forget. The opening lines of Romans reveals the identities of several people. First of all, it reveals the identity of Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord, Paul says. Jesus is Yahweh. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, we're accustomed to the word order in English, Jesus is Lord. But in the Greek New Testament, the order is the Lord is Jesus. Yahweh is Jesus. Who is Jesus? He is the Jewish Messiah. He is God's unique son. He is the one who was foretold by the Jewish prophets. He is the supreme subject of the Holy Scriptures, both Old and New Testament. He was born in a body of human flesh into the royal lineage of David, Paul says. He died, but now he is risen from the dead, proving him to be God's holy and powerful son. He's the one who gives grace and calls men to believe on him and so to be saved. Next, the identity of Paul is revealed in Romans 1 going to look at Paul more closely next week. The Lord's given me a great word on spiritual authority to share with you next week. But Paul was a love slave of Messiah Jesus. He was set apart from birth for the gospel, the good news of Jesus. By God's grace, he was commissioned to be an apostle assigned to the Gentiles. Finally, the identity of believers is revealed in Romans 1. And that's really what I want to talk about this morning. Do you really know who you are as a believer in Jesus Christ? Do you really know who God has recreated you in Christ to be? What God has destined for you, both in this life and in the life to come? Do you know who you are in Christ? 
There's three things that I want to share with you quickly today from Romans 1. Do you know who you are in Christ? Three things quickly. The first one is this. You are called to belong to Messiah Jesus. In Romans, Paul is being a spiritual father. He's doing what spiritual fathers do. He's giving identity to his children. Paul was called by Jesus to be a spiritual father. And the Roman believers didn't have a spiritual father. Apparently the church in Rome was founded by Jews who were visiting in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. They became believers in Yeshua, believers in Jesus. And when they went home to Rome, they started spreading the gospel. And so that church was born. The church in Rome did have some pastoral leaders like Priscilla and Aquila, but they didn't have an apostolic father. And that's why Paul is reaching out to them beginning with this letter. Dr. Doug Weiss talked to us two weeks ago about the role of fathers giving identity to their children. And that is what Paul is doing in the opening lines of Romans. He's telling the Roman believers who they are. And listen, who they are is who we are. Now we need to take a moment. I need you to, to just hang in there with me for just, just a little bit. He who endures to the end will speak in tongues. So I need you to just, I need you to just hold in there with me for a minute and listen. We need to talk about the thorough Jewishness of these opening lines of Romans. Practically every word in these first few verses is a significant buzzword of the Jewish faith. Son of God is a significant Old Testament term. Son of David is a significant messianic term from the Old Testament. Spirit of holiness was a very Jewish way to refer to the Holy Spirit. Gospel, the word is euangelion, good news, actually comes from the Old Testament. Isaiah says that the coming of Messiah will bring euangelion, it will bring good news, it will bring the gospel of freedom from captivity for Israel. Apostle is a distinctively Christian term, starting with Jesus, but the New Testament apostles were understood to be a continuation of the ministry of the Old Testament prophets. But in particular, these words, love slave, called, set apart, beloved of God, these are words that are all significant to the Jewish people. Israel was called out from among all people, beginning with Abraham. Israel was set apart for God's divine purposes in the world. Israel was called God's servant, God's love slave. Servant was the highest title of honor that could be given to a Jewish leader. Moses was called the servant, the love slave of God. Joshua, David, Jonah, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they are called servants of the Most High God. So you have to understand that, that every word in these opening verses are thoroughly Jewish. Now, why is that important? What is uh, that relevance to us? What's the point? Listen, listen. Paul is making it very clear that these Gentiles have now been called to belong to the Jewish Messiah. These Gentiles have now been been called to belong to, to Christ Jesus. They have been called to belong to the Jewish Messiah. And listen, when you belong to the Messiah, all the promises of God wrapped up in the Messiah belong to you. And that's where it gets interesting. In verse 6, Paul says, You, among all Gentiles, have been called to belong to Messiah. The U is emphatic. It means Y-O-U in all capital letters with a dozen exclamation points behind it. It means you distinctively, you particularly, you especially, you exclusively have been called to belong to Messiah. Do you remember that iconic scene when Oprah gave away a new car to every member in her studio audience? And in her own Oprah-ish way, she just kind of went berserk and she started shouting, you get a new car, and you get a new car, and you get a new car, and you, and you, and you get a new car. 
You know, it's estimated that 8 million people were watching that day. That's the population of New York City. But only 276 lucky people got a car. That would be like out of all the people in New York, just the people in this room right now are the only ones who got a car. And that's exactly how we're supposed to read Romans 1 verse 6. You have been called to belong to Messiah Jesus. Out of 7.5 billion people on planet Earth, you have just hit the grandest jackpot in all of life. You get a new life, and 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 you get a new life. Honestly, we need the help of the Holy Spirit to understand how profound it is. Just like Abraham was called apart to belong to God, we now have been called apart to belong to the seed of Abraham, the Messiah Jesus. And that means that all the promises of God that belong to the Jewish people from Abraham forward now belong to us too. Try these promises on for size. You will not live in fear. Because I am your shield and your very great reward. I will bless you and I will make you a blessing. I will bless them that bless you and I will mess with them that mess with you. And through you, I will bless all the families on the earth. You see, to belong to the Jewish Messiah means that we are regarded as righteous by God, just like Abraham was regarded as righteous. And God has promised, has he not, that he will take care of the righteous. God does not withhold any good thing from the righteous, Psalm 34, 10. God grants the righteous what they desire, Proverbs 10, verse 24. God will add to the righteous every provision they need for life, Matthew 6, 33. God will guide every footstep of the righteous, Psalm 37, 23. And God's direction will become clearer and clearer and clearer for the righteous through life, Proverbs 4, 18. God gives the righteous person wisdom and good judgment, Psalm 37, 32. The righteous person will, ah, this is my favorite, the righteous person will thrive like a green leaf, Proverbs 11, verse 28. He'll be honored by others. People will look at his life and say, God really does reward the righteous. Psalm 58, verse 11. The righteous person will be joyful and satisfied with the outcomes of his life. Isaiah 3, verse 10. He won't be tormented by discontentment. He won't be haunted by the worry that he's wasted his life or spent it unwisely or missed out on something better. Proverbs 10, verse 3. God will give the righteous person joy and peace and security. Psalm 97, 11. He will not live in anxiety or paranoia, dreading bad news. Psalm 112, verse 7. The righteous person will never be forsaken by God. Psalm 37, 25. The righteous person is not alone in times of trouble. God is with him. The righteous person might have many afflictions, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Psalm 34, verse 19. The righteous man might fall down seven times, but he gets up eight. Proverbs 24, verse 16. God will not allow the righteous to be shaken, for God is a strength in time of trouble. Indeed, the righteous man will get stronger and stronger from strength to strength. God will lift his burdens and sustain him even in darkness. Light shines for the righteous. Psalm 112 verse 4. God will shield the righteous and deliver them from evil plots against them. God will protect the children and the grandchildren of the righteous. God will give the righteous person a long life. Psalm 91 verse 16. Most importantly, the righteous person will inherit eternal life. And when this life is over... He'll be taken away from the trouble and the difficulty of this life and enter into God's peace. Isaiah 57, verse 2. You, you, you have been called from among all people to belong to Messiah Jesus. All the promises of God wrapped up in Messiah now belong to you. The promises of Abraham belong to you. The promises to the righteous belong to you. But best of all, to belong to the Jewish Messiah 
is to be loved by God. Like Abraham was loved by God. You from among all Gentiles are called to belong to Messiah Jesus and verse 7 to be loved by God. You know the very best promise that God made to the righteous is that we'll enjoy his presence on earth. That we'll encounter him, that we'll experience him. Regardless of all these wonderful promises for provision and protection and, and health, David said, there's only one thing that I want from him. There's only one thing I desire. There's only one thing I pursue. And that's to experience his presence, the beauty of his presence. The call that we've received is a call into a love relationship with God through Jesus the Son. You have been called to know God. And to be known by God. You have been called to experience the beauty of God's love. You have been called to communicate with God. You talk to God and God actually talks back to you. You've been called to have God disclose to you his secrets and his intentions. You've been called to learn and understand the ways of God. How he works supernaturally on the earth and what he's doing in this very hour. We say God's ways are past finding out. And it's true, God's ways are beyond human discovery, but God reveals his ways to the righteous. Yeah, yeah. Moses prayed, God teach me your ways, and God answered his prayer. It says in Psalm 103 verse 4, Moses understood his ways. David said, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. Jesus said, I tell my business to my friends and you are my friends. Paul said, no one on earth knows the mind of the Lord, but we do. And that is something for sure the devil hopes you never find out. Do you know who you are? You've been called to belong to Messiah, Jesus. You've been called to be loved by God. Do you know who you are in Christ? Three things from Romans 1. You're called to belong to Messiah. The second thing is this. You are called to be a saint. Paul says, you also, in verse 6, are among those called to belong to Messiah. In verse 7, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you. At a quick glance, if you, if you look at Paul's letters, every one of his letters open with these words, grace and peace to you. And if you look at it at a, at a quick glance, it looks like an ordinary greeting. In Greek letters in the first century, the greeting was always kyrene, which means joy to you. But Paul changed one little letter and he changed kyrene into charis, grace. So joy to you was changed into grace to you. And then Paul added the Jewish greeting shalom, peace, which means wholeness to you. So what looks at a quick glance like an ordinary greeting is changed into an extraordinary blessing. Grace and wholeness to you. Do you know it's actually part of the ironic blessing, the blessing that Jewish fathers were to speak over their children every day. The Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace. And maybe that gives us a helpful picture of what it really means to be a saint. Saint is another Jewish buzzword in Romans 1. When we think of saints, we think about great characters, heroes of the faith, either heroes of the faith in the Bible or heroes of faith in church history. But the word saint is simply someone who was ordinary that became set apart for God. Abraham was an ordinary idol worshiper who God called to become set apart from everyone else. Israel was an ordinary dysfunctional Bedouin family whom God called to be set apart from all the other nations on the earth. And that's our story too. Now a handful of us here are Jewish by birth but for the rest of us we were just ordinary, idolatrous, dysfunctional Gentiles until God set us apart for something extraordinary. At a quick glance, we might look pretty ordinary, but Jesus has come along and he's added a little twist that has changed everything. What are saints? Saints are ordinary people set apart for an extraordinary spiritual existence. 
Saints means that we have now been set apart to have extraordinary encounters with God, extraordinary supernatural experiences, and these are our way of life now. Saints mean that we are set apart to continually minister to the Lord, going in and out of His presence daily in worship and prayer. Saints means that we are set apart now for dreams and visions and angelic visitations and prophetic manifestations and signs and wonders and miracles. What are saints? Saints are ordinary people set apart for extraordinary purposes. That word saint is also the word holy. It's the same word. And it means something that has been removed from ordinary use and set apart exclusively for God's use. We were set apart. We were removed from among everyone else. We were removed from an ordinary life, from ordinary use. And we've been set apart exclusively to bring God glory and to do his work on earth. And onto our very ordinary beings, God has poured extraordinary favor and extraordinary power to accomplish this work. That is what grace is. It's divine favor and divine power to finish the mission. Oh, you're called to be a saint? Well, grace to you then. You're called to be a saint? Well, favor to you then. You're called to be a saint? Well, divine power to you then. You're called to be a saint? Peace to you then. Wholeness, security, confidence, mental and emotional stability, clear-mindedness, courage. You're called to be a saint? Grace and peace to you then. Power and wholeness to you then. What are saints? Saints are ordinary people set apart to achieve extraordinary outcomes. Do you know what it means that God has called you to be a saint? It means that the same favor and power that rested on Abraham now rests on you. You remember the story? There were four kings that got together. They got their armies together and they went on a rampage. There were five kings that tried to withstand them, but the four kings overpowered the five kings and they kidnapped Lot, Abraham's nephew and his family and everything that belonged to him. So Abraham said, not today. And he got together 318 men from his own house and he went and took down the four kings that the five kings couldn't withstand. That's power and favor on your life. The same power and favor is resting on you. Saint means that the same power and favor that rested on Isaac now rests on you. During a drought, Isaac's crop produced a 100-fold harvest. And when the other kings saw the favor of God on his life, they finally backed off from harassing him. Saint means that the same favor and power that rested on Jacob now rests on you. Crooked uncle Laban cut Jacob's pay 10 times over 20 years, and yet Jacob still grew grew more prosperous by far than Laban because God was with him. That favor and power, it's on you. Saint means that the same power and favor that rested on Joseph now rests on you. What the enemy has meant for evil in your life, what the enemy has meant for the destruction of your family, God is going to take and turn and he's going to use it for his glory and your good and for the salvation of many. What does it mean that you're a saint? It means that the same favor and power that rested on Moses rests on you. What was on Joshua rests on you. Who should we talk about? Should we talk about Gideon? Should we talk about Deborah? Should we talk about Ruth? Should we talk about Samuel or David or Solomon? What rested on them now rests on you. Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Esther, Mordecai. Who should we talk about? What rested on them now rests on you. Everybody look at me. This is what saint means. <laughs> saint means that you might look ordinary on the outside. But underneath that mild-mannered exterior, there is a supernatural man. Yeah. Behind those librarian glasses, there is a signs and wonders woman. Yeah. 
Here's what I want you to remember from now on. Every time you see Superman, every time you see the S on his chest, I want you to remember that what it stands for is saints. The world might think you're just a boring old Clark Kent, but you are a supernatural man and a signs and wonders woman. Do you know who you are in Christ? Three things in Romans 1. You're called to belong to Messiah Jesus. You're called to be a saint. And finally this, you are called to live by faith. Worship team, you can come help me. The believers in Rome didn't have a spiritual father. So Paul is being a spiritual father to them. He's identifying them. And he's calling them to live by faith. He says, through Jesus, I received the grace of apostleship to call Gentile people to the obedience of faith. The book of Romans opens and closes with those words, the obedience of faith. The obedience of faith is in the very beginning and it's at the very end. And everything in between in the book of Romans is a description of the obedience of faith. We have been called to belong to Messiah Jesus. The way that we belong to him is by believing on him. The way that we belong to him is by accepting what he said about our need and accepting the provision he's made through his cross. And when we belong to him by believing, it changes us. God looked and he saw that his old covenant people had a problem. They lacked the ability to obey the law of Moses. They lacked the innate desire to obey God. In fact, they were inclined precisely to disobey. They lacked the knowledge and wisdom to obey God when confronted with a, a gray area. They lacked the inner strength to obey God. So God made a promise. He said when Messiah came, he would make a new covenant with his people. This is what God said. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you. I'll take out your old hard heart of stone and I'll give you a new soft heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you. And I will move you to follow my decrees and keep my laws. When by faith we belong to the Jewish Messiah, these messianic promises of a changed heart belong to us. What does it mean to be called to the obedience of faith? Faith causes God to look at us and regard us as righteous, just like he regarded Abraham as righteous. When we belong to Jesus by believing, God no longer looks at us and regards us as sinners, but he regards us as righteous in Jesus. Even though we still sin at times, God doesn't count our sins against us. What does it mean to be called to the obedience of faith? It means that faith causes a radical transformation. The Holy Spirit comes into our heart and changes the affections of our heart so that there are no longer idols that we worship before God. He changes the sinful desires of our heart into righteous desires. He transforms the disobedient inclination of our heart into an obedient inclination. In every situation that confronts us, we instinctively know what would Jesus do. And we desire to do that and we have the strength to do that. The Holy Spirit enables us to keep God's law that could never before be kept. That is the obedience of faith. What does it mean to be called to the obedience of faith? It means that our life is radically reoriented. Like Paul, we too become love slaves of Messiah. We become set apart from ordinary use to be used exclusively to bring God glory. Now listen, that doesn't mean we check out of everyday life. It just means that everything we do now brings him glory. Our work brings him glory. Our family brings him glory. Our talents and achievements bring him glory. Our relationships bring him glory. Our worship brings him glory. Do you know who you are in Christ? It's what the devil never ever wants you to find out. And if ever you do find out, it's what he wants you to forget. 
but I'm here today to speak the words of a spiritual father over you. I'm here today to help you know who you are. You are called to belong to Messiah. And all the promises of Messiah belong to you. You're called to be loved by God. You're called righteous by God. You're called to be a saint. You are called to live by faith in the obedience of faith. That's who you are. You want to know the most amazing thing? That's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just the first seven verses of the book of Romans. It's just one sentence in Greek. That's just one sentence of Romans. That's just one sentence of all Paul's letters. That's just one sentence of the New Testament. That's just one sentence of the entire Bible. Imagine what else the Bible has to say about who you are. We're going to find out what Romans has to say together. And I hope you'll join us for that journey. Would you stand on your feet this morning and would you give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place.